hello. I'm uh, Nate Mosier, I'm Department Head in Agricultural and Biological Engineering, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker for this uh, afternoon. It is now. Uh, Shweta Singh is an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering with a joint appointment in Environmental and Ecological Engineering here at Purdue University. Uh, Dr. Singh uh, received a BTEC in Chemical Engineering from IIT BHU in Varanasi, India, and a master's in applied statistics, and a PhD in chemical engineering, both from the Ohio State University, uh, just next door in Ohio. Uh, from 2012 to 2013, she was a National Research Council postdoc in residence in the Western Ecology Division of the US EPA. And 2013 to 14, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto in Canada before joining us here at Purdue University. Dr. Singh's research focuses on advancing systems methodologies and computational tools for studying um, how uh, manufacturing systems and energy systems um, interact with one another and how new technologies change them and can enable more renewable uh, decarbonization, better uh, for the environment, more sustainable manufacturing. Her research has been supported by funding from several federal, private, and nonprofit organizations, including the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Army Research Lab, and the International Renewable Energy Agency. She was one of 83 early career engineers that were invited by the National Academy of Engineers to attend the U.S. Frontiers of Engineering Symposium in 2021. And she was awarded the AICHE Environmental Division Early Career Award in, also in 2021, and a Young Achiever Award from her alma mater, IIT BHU, in 2021. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shweta Singh. Okay. Uh, can you all hear me well? Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Nate, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you, Marsha, and everyone for organizing this event. It's wonderful to be sharing some of my journey. and. Uh, when I was making this talk, it was, I think, one of the most challenging talks I have ever made because it was a lot of reflections and a lot of trying to connect the dots. When the path is not very linear, it becomes much challenging, but I think it's also fun. So I would like to begin by thanking my mom and dad, especially my mom. My mom never graduated from high school, so it's dedicated to all the first-generation students and faculty here, but their excitement and enthusiasm for supporting my education when women education was still not very prevalent in the part of the country I grew up is really instrumental in me being standing here today. So of course, I wish they were here, but my dad has never come to US, and I don't think he will come, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so going back, since I grew up in a household where there was not a lot of scientists and I didn't have exposure, what was happening in the country and in media was truly instrumental in informing me what I, was, uh, I wanted to do. And one of that was basically a Chipko movement, which is one of the earliest conservation, forest conservation movement that was there in India. And you can see these tribal women literally hugging the tree. I think that's where the term tree huggers have come. But it was truly that the deforestation was affecting the livelihood of these women. And at that, I got inspired. And as a kid, that's what you do. So I wrote a poem. And I wrote a poem about saving the environment that got published in the annual magazine when I was in grade seventh. And that was really something that was, oh, maybe this is what I would want to do, maybe write poetry to save environment. And I grew up in this town, which is Varansi. It's uh, one of the unique thing is that it's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities of the world. So talking about sustainable cities, there's a lot to learn from this city, but this very chaotic as well. This looks pretty, but when you look closely, there's a lot of plastic debris, and we all are aware about the plastic waste. So growing up, I participated in a lot of community events, growing, going out with the school team and actually cleaning the debris out of the city's uh, rivers so that it does not reach the sea. Of course, we failed tremendously. This was in 1990s, and we still have that issue. So I thought that, OK, this is something maybe I'll do for a living. Maybe I'll just help clean the cities out of the waste. But then I had an event where I visited a friend's house, and I watched this movie. This is a 1966 movie. It's called Fantastic Voyage, and it's a fantastic movie because it shows a journey through human body 
in a very small submarine where the scientists are shrunk and there was one woman scientist so I was very inspired that maybe I will travel in submarine someday. And uh, so I got fascinated with human body, <coughs> understanding brain, started studying about Alzheimer's disease and a lot more and thought maybe I'll become a doctor. I had no idea. Of course, I was also fascinated with submarines. I did not know what to do to basically drive a submarine. So then I graduate high school, and the career choices come in front of me, which was engineering and medicine. And of course, my parents wanted to be a doctor, like a real doctor, which I never became, and I don't <laughs> think I can become. But uh, there was this statistics that there were more women in medicine at that time in India for some reason, and not l more in medicine, sorry, in engineering. And my parents, of course, wanted me to go for the better path of medicine. And I, being a true teenager, I rebelled. And I was like, I am going to go to engineering. They relented. I got lucky. I, I basically cleared the exam to go to one of the IITs. And the fortunate thing was that this was in my city, so my parents had like no more uh, restrictions for me to become an engineer. And so I became an engineer. Of course, this was not all. I had no idea what engineers do till now. I was like, OK, I'm going to become an engineer. And then there were choices. And the choices were all of this in front of me. And someone said that girls don't study mechanical engineer. So I became a chemical engineer. And of course, in my batch, there were six girls in chemical engineering and only one girl in mechanical engineer. So I was very happy. OK, I made a better choice. But then, of course, we know that's not true. But from here, my life completely changed. Uh, once I entered undergraduate, and of course, being in IITs, which is one of the top institutes, I got exposed to a lot more things that I was at my hometown, sorry, in my household environment. <coughs> so the first thing I did was I started researching. I actually went into the library stacks. And back in those days, I had to climb up the ladder on the, in the library to actually pull out journal stacks. And the first review paper that I did was on the biomass waste to energy. And I'm so surprised to see that today, it's still, it's a very, very relevant uh, technology and uh, research question. And this was completely a self-study. But then I started pestering some of my professors, <laughs> and I asked them to give me project. And the second project that I got was on modeling biological oxygen demand along the river Ganges, so understanding how we are really ruining the uh, marine ecosystems or freshwater ecosystem. That was in my junior year. And then I got very fortunate. There were two French students who were visiting my institute. And my, I was there in the summer. I had nothing to do. My professor was like, can you show them around the city? I said, well, yes, I also want to join them in the lab. And I joined them in the lab. And with these two French students, we started exploring photocatalysis for clean energy. And we were uh, basically synthesizing platinum-loaded cadmium sulfide for uh, breaking down water into hydrogen, clean hydrogen. So learned a lot about XRD, SEM, TEM on all the strong analytical techniques. And that's when I was like, this is what I want to do for life, chemical engineering. And uh, so my undergraduate research experience, which was kind of not a very linear, well thought out plan, gave me an idea of going into chemical engineering. But then, of course, life is not always as we plan. So there were no jobs in chemical engineering. I did interview at a couple of uh, Indian companies, Indian Oil and uh, HLL that we call, and didn't get the job. I became very ambitious and applied directly to the Netherlands office of Shell, <laughs> and of course did not get the job. I did got uh, one or a couple of round of interview, which was surprising. But so I settled in for a software developer job. So that's where I learned a lot about software engineering and Java. And then we were doing a project for content management and content uh, deployment to a new portal. And my role was to really design the portal and connect with the back end. So this was completely new for me. Of course, I was not happy, but I still learned. And I think in, that, in retrospect, that was a very interesting detour because it gave me a systems perspective about how different things connect together when you want to achieve a goal. And still, after this, I knew that I wanted to do chemical engineering, and that was not possible for me to do in India. 
So I applied, and US was my first choice. And I got accepted into Ohio State University, where my statement of purpose was all about catalyst synthesis. I wanted to develop new materials. But then I met my future advisor, Dr. Bakshi, who was doing this macro scale research, who were connecting process systems engineering to ecosystems and macroeconomics, statistics, and I completely jumped the ship. It was again an unknown territory, but it was so fascinating and so much going back to my love of saving environment that I was like, this is what maybe I want to pursue. And then of course, rest is history because this was a very upcoming field. And then I went on to do a postdoc with uh, the Western Ecology Division working on biogeochemical cycles. And later on, changed the field into going to University of Toronto where I worked on urban system science. So this is what has kind of a serendipitous journey to sustainability science and engineering. So what I do today is we actually develop theories and models to design our manufacturing system to work within the limits of ecosystems. So we of course want to meet all the demand and all the goals of uh, next generation manufacturing but without damaging our ecosystem. So when we think about this economic subsystem where all our manufacturing system is, it's kind of a black box. We really don't understand the connections across national, region, or uh, global. So what we focus on is actually opening this black box and mapping all the interconnections. So if we want to design that macro scale system, we really want to understand what's happening inside that system. So some of the anal uh, analogy that I give is kind of human genome mapping. Unless we mapped the whole genome, we cannot edit a specific genome to really understand the interaction. So it's kind of a complex network, and that's what uh, drives our whole manufacturing systems today. So in a sense, it's a macroscopic complex systems challenge. As engineers, we are adept at studying individual nodes. We design technology at the individual nodes. But if we really want to design our sustainable manufacturing systems, we want them to understand all the interconnections so that we can know where the trajectory is going in future. And that's what the field of industrial ecology do. It basically looks at industrial networks as industrial ecosystem and maybe hopefully in future can design it at that macro scale. But it's a really difficult challenge because we are talking about maybe thousands of different in kinds of technologies interacting and really thinking about that design. So in my lab, what we do is we design these multi-scale modeling methods and computational methods for industrial ecology. And I'll highlight the three specific uh, aspects or thrust. One is the physical mapping, another is the economic mapping, and then the dynamics understanding. So for physical mapping, this is mostly just network mapping of how different industries are interacting with each other. It's a very tedious task, and it's very slow. So most of the, so far, the status quo had been empirical mapping. But what we have done in our lab is develop this algorithm that where if we have mechanistic models for different industries and we put it in our algorithm, it automatically generates the network map. And the idea is that with this automatic generation, we also have a quantification of emissions and waste generation in the network. Some of the application is in supply chain redesign. So if we have a new technology we want to introduce at a different scale, we introduce the model, and we can see how the network will change. And we can do that iteratively to really come to an optimal design so that we are overall at the macro scale reducing the emissions, but also creating a zero waste system. So that's one of the first thing that we did. And we have a cloud-based automation tool for it, which is under, right now, a lot of development. But uh, the, we really thank National Science Foundation to support this work. The next thrust that we have done is we have developed what we call as US Industrial Ecology Virtual Lab. And this is, again, a large scale network optimization kind of approach where we can study how the industry in one region, let's say Illinois, is interacting with California. And we can study the cascading impact or supply chain impact of disruptions and changes in different regions. So it's a large matrix model. There, uh, for US, it will be about 52,000 by 52,000 kind of model. But this is in collaboration with University of Sydney, Professor Manfred Lenzen, and uh, this is a really powerful economic lab that we have right now, which is very unique to our 
group and we are using it for studying the impact of transitioning to decarbonization system or even circular economy in the future. The last thing is about network dynamics. So since now we have an approach to do the static mapping of physical network and economic network, now we understand, want to understand the dynamics. And with the advent of data, we are taking use of machine learning kind of model using mechanistic dynamic model and then creating surrogate dynamical model using machine learning. And then kind of putting all of that together to understand the overall dynamics of the network. So where are we going next? So now we have three thrusts, static mapping, physical network, economic, and dynamics. Next is basically, it's a good time to actually look into the future of sustainable manufacturing and taking more of a convergent approach. So one key project we are working right now is on sustainable energetics manufacturing, which is in collaboration with uh, Professor Baldwin, Professor Hartman, and Professor Sutherland. And here we are thinking of optimizing the process value chain for reshoring a lot of the defense manufacturing within the US. The next is, of course, uh, pharmaceutical circular supply chains with very eminent team. Professor Reclitis is here. And uh, uh, it's kind of taking a convergent approach of using cyber infrastructure and ecological thinking to redesign our biomanufacturing supply chain in the US. And also really thinking about advancing education because next generation manufacturing will require retraining and reskill development of the way designing has been done. And uh, really an exciting time for advancing the foundations of sustainable manufacturing, especially after we have seen the supply chain disruptions in the COVID times, and also thinking about more regional versus local and uh, global kind of manufacturing. So yeah, next four or five years, I think with the tools that we have developed right now in our lab, we have a lot of wonderful application in bioeconomy, uh, so let's say plastic manufacturing, energetics manufacturing. So I think right now we do have a lot more to explore that I'm really looking forward. With that, I would be summarizing, and I'm really grateful for the journey. A lot of all, it was unplanned, but I'm so glad to be here. Sometimes I feel like Alice in Wonderland that I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I'm so excited that I'm here. I especially would like to thank my PhD advisor, who is kind of a pioneer in sustainable chemical engineering. He started working at it in 25 years ago when people were not even talking about it, so I was fascinated with the line of thought. And uh, Professor Chris Kennedy, of course, he's a pioneer in urban metabolism, so really looking at cities as living organism and how can we design it to be more sustainable. Dr. Jana Compton, who is an ecologist with whom I learned a lot about bio, sorry, biogeochemistry. All my students, of course, without their hard work, some of my students are here. So thank you so much for joining. And uh, I have excellent students, Will Farlesist, who just won the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. And he is an exciting line of research. He's actually trained as a robotics engineer. So I'm so glad that he's jumping the ship. Uh, and also a lot of my undergraduate. One of them, Isha Sura, is here, who is going to do her PhD at Northwestern in Chemical Engineering. So congratulations. And of course, a lot of mentors and inspirations. I would like to thank uh, Professor Mosier. Professor Engel could not be here, our ABE department heads, and Professor Sutherland, especially for the support of my interdisciplinary research, which was very different than a traditional engineer. And my mentors in ABE and IEEE, and uh, Professor Radish, who is here, thank you so much, because uh, I do want to quote, I was training for half marathon. That's what I do when I'm just frustrated with proposal rejection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but uh, Professor Radish is really fast. So he would finish his 10 mile, and then he'll come back, and then he'll go, come get me. <laughs> so yeah, it was really a true gesture of telling me that how supported I feel in AVE and at Purdue. Uh, Professor Rakesh Agrawal, I think from him I learned a lot about questioning everything. So I remember having a discussion about nonlinear thermodynamics. And he said that just because a Nobel Prize winner said that, don't just believe it, question it. So I was like, really, that helped me think about science really well. And Professor Reclitus, thank you for all the support, because we were submitting the proposal. It was getting 
declined, and then he mentioned that, well, be ambitious, keep trying. You may try even for the 13th time, but just keep trying. So thank you for helping me keeping going. Professor Greg Shaver, he's here, and uh, Professor Michelle Mozon, they are my CRN mentors, Coaching Resource Network, and that has been truly instrumental in my success, so I really appreciate that support. And uh, Professor Monica Ivanstinova, we lost her, and uh, I still remember she was a force of inspiration, dedication, and the leadership. I was just, like when I came to AB, I was like, oh, I'm so glad to be here to have these kind of leadership. So with that, thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Swetta. OK, we're working. So I'm John Sutherland. I'm head of environmental ecological engineering. So we have a few questions for Professor Singh. Thanks, John. Uh, well, congratulations, uh, also on your early career research award that you just got from Purdue. Um, okay, so your education is all in chemical engineering, but you're ABE and jointly appointed in Tripoli, so that's actually jointly appointed across two colleges. Was that the plan when you came to Purdue, or did that also just develop, and how, how does that facilitate your research? Uh, you know, I think a lot of it was not planned, but since I enjoyed doing uh, research in both areas, uh, I think it's, uh, it's really good for me to see both ends of the world, like how natural systems engineering happen, like a lot of uh, AB faculty look at the water systems and the grain systems and all of that, and from an engineering perspective, like really looking at manufacturing and chemical engineering and processing. So I think being in two colleges has been truly helpful for me to really expand and see. And also for my students, I think a lot of time the engineering training becomes in a silo and that has to go away when we are thinking about sustainability and sustainable manufacturing because truly we are thinking about, we are dealing with issues like climate change and ecosystems collapse, which has a long-term impact and engineers have a very significant role to play. So for me, it's, uh, it happened naturally, it happened not by plan. I applied to Purdue Tripoli opening, but of course there was a joint appointment opportunity and um, yeah, I, I, I can say it's just, I would say uh, it sometimes it gets a little bit stretched because I don't understand what uh, ag machinery people do, but that's okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is Vilas, uh, Faculty of Chemical Engineering. Uh, the question is, you were saying there, was, there were no jobs in chemical engineering. <laughs> is it uh, true yet? Or it no, I think it has now? changed a lot. But back then, there were a couple of jobs, and they were really, I mean, I hate to say that, but they, they were truly not open to women engineers. I mean, I had that question early on, that would you be comfortable working in a plant setting? It was like, of course, I'm here for the job. But didn't get it, yeah. First off, Oswita, oh, really thank you for sharing this beautiful, beautiful story about your personal journey. I think it's very powerful, it's remarkable and inspiring as a first generation of, uh, you know, immigrants, of female students and so on and so forth. And what I'm really appreciating, you share some of your failure story, right? It has been rejected for application, for a company, and so that really show the true persistence and grades what we really cherish at Purdue, and uh, thank you for doing that. Um, I guess the one thing I really want to learn is, you know, I have been seeing you, you were saying, you know, the success is not linear. Yes, it's not linear, but in your case, exponential. I think it's growing very rapidly, right? Because you're connecting the dots from all the directions. The one thing personally, and also I think from college, we're very interested in understanding the landscape of sustainable manufacture. Clearly, you're one of the pioneers and leaders in that area. Can you talk a little bit about you know, where Purdue is in the, you know, the national landscape of the research area and what we're lacking and how can we you know, emphasize or enhance that area. Mm -hmm. Maybe oh. John, you, you're interested in that. 
Yeah, that'd be, I'd be interested. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Professor Lu, for the question, and thank you for your comment. Uh, I think Purdue is a great place for sustainable manufacturing because, uh, of course, semiconductor is something that has been talked a lot, but in sp in also pharmaceutical manufacturing. So we just got a big uh, a grant on working with uh, that. So we have a very unique facility with, with that is led by Professor Reclitus, Professor Negi. So we have a lot of opportunities there. Semiconductor, of course, we also, I also think the bioeconomy, so we have great leaders in bio biological manufacturing that also involves biologics and all of that. Uh, other than, I think, uh, even in automotive sector, we have great uh, opportunities. So I feel that this is the right place for starting the sustainable manufacturing, next-gen manufacturing, and a lot of those things. In terms of, also, I think I want to comment on uh, the cyberspace because a lot of uh, IOTs and stuff, so cyber manufacturing is something that's where Purdue definitely has a opportunity to grow in that area a lot more. Mm, I think where we are currently lacking a little bit is this uh, push on the ecological connections. I think that's where a lot of European universities are really taking the lead, and I think that's where we'll have a lot of things to really talk about, because we do have a great College of Agriculture and College of Science, so that collaboration can become much stronger in for really enhancing sustainable manufacturing. Yeah. That was pretty good. Yeah, that was Thank good. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we have time for a couple more. I don't comment a lot, I just support staff here, but um, hearing all three of these talks um, kind of connected some dots on maybe an article I need to write on trying to polish my writing, but um, there seems to be a big disconnect with the hard work researchers do to make machines like diesel engines cleaner. Um, you know, environmental things, and I've actually engaged, I, I can't remember the retired Senate, state senator, no, excuse me, one of our senators, uh, he's retired, it was back in the Obama administration. Um, I ride bicycle out in the country. I've had the particulates from the diesel trucks rolled on me numerous times, and I've, I've asked police officers why the emissions that are removed from these things so easily, and you know, I know this isn't quite your area, but um, how can we connect the dots from, or, or We've, we've got federal rules, you guys have made great progress, but yet at the enforcement level, at the state level, it seems to be ignored. I've had a police officer say they don't enforce federal, what do you call it, admissions policy. Um, I've had other people say they don't even know what I'm talking about, it must be a broken down truck, but anyone, anyway, that's my point. I, I'm wanting to help somehow. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I don't have the right answer, but I think uh, <laughs> I do see there is a lot of scope for citizen science. So there is a lot of gap between what environmental researchers and academicians have done and what gets out there in hands of citizens and the way. And another thing is making it more easier to adopt these policies would be something that we can do. So that's a lot of uh, research gap, I would say, that exists in terms of translation. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, the intent was conservation, but then uh, I think that got really badly uh, put in the light that, oh, these tree huggers, they are not, they are against development or anything. But if you go back to the history of that movement, it was actually about livelihoods, local livelihoods. So the disconnect between local impact versus what is happening in the global, I think that multi-scale connection needs to be made before we can take that in context. She had a very nice talk. I had a question on your sustainability and your analysis of the pharmaceutical supply chain. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone recognizes, but what's the impact on delivering different types of medicines to parts of the world that no longer or, or do not have access to them yet? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it will be a huge impact. I have not, uh, I think uh, Dr. Carrie Clays can definitely speak more to it, but uh, that part is there and uh, 
And I also think that the impact on environment is also huge because of the waste medicines and the way it is damaging ecosystems and how can we bring it back into the supply chain and recycling and remanufacturing. In uh, lots of uh, remote parts where there is no access of medicine, I think uh, I would definitely see that uh, when you get back the work hours from people when they are uh, not that sick and they can actually enjoy the quality of life, that's a huge impact. The improvement in quality of life is exponential if we can do that, especially with the distributed kind of manufacturing or modeler that Professor Atlantis is doing. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Maybe one more. What time are we supposed to? Okay, till we're done. Okay. <laughs> I think there's one at the back. Oh. Hi, so my name is Isha. I'm one of her undergrads. Um, she's honestly truly been an inspiration for my like undergraduate research and kind of what I want to pursue uh, in grad school as well. So I wanted to ask you, um, Based off your presentation, it seems like you've been pretty ambitious about uh, being driven by your curiosity. You know, whenever an opportunity comes up, you kind of take it. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, has there ever been anything that you wish uh, maybe you had spent more like time on or some, not really regret, but something that maybe you hope to spend time on in the future, maybe something that you didn't get to explore that, you know, maybe a road that you didn't take um, because something else was in front of you. Is there anything that maybe you're hoping to, to study or, or look into? Yeah, for sure. I think if I look back into my undergrad selection, uh, scientific computation was something I left. But it has such a huge impact on research and the way we are doing data science, data driven research, that I would definitely want to learn more about scientific computation and how at the back end things are working. So maybe I'll take a sabbatical and do that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. All right, let's thank Professor Singh one last time. <laughs>